So what I want to do here in these pre-lab videos is really talk about what you're going to be doing in the lab, or the goals, and then sort of walk through the different parts that you're going to be working on. And if there's a specific calculation that you need to do or specific procedure that you're going to need to do that's a little complicated, I'm going to walk you through those steps and discuss the details of either the calculation or the experimental procedure. So let's get into the measurements lab. There are four different things that you're going to be doing in this lab. You're going to be measuring using a ruler, the different types of shapes. You're going to measure the volume of water sample using two different volumetric devices, a graduated cylinder and a beaker. And you're going to measure the mass of an item using two different types of balances. And then lastly, you're going to measure the melting point, uh, which is the temperature at which a solid turns into a liquid using a thermometer and a certain experimental setup. So before we actually do the experiments, I want to talk a little bit about how these measurements are done and how to read you know, measuring devices correctly. So when you measure using what I call non-digital devices, which are basically devices that don't give you a number right away. For example, like an electronic scale, a ruler will not do that. It will just give you these measurements in marks and you have to learn how to read those marks correctly. Let's say your object ends where this arrow is. What's the correct length of the object? You have to follow a certain type of steps. And the steps are first, you need to determine what is the size of each of these little marks because all you have is the number one and number two here. The unit here is also important, so that's in centimeter. So the number one and number two, and what you need to determine is what is the size of each of these marks. Now, the easy way to do that is to count all the marks starting from mark number one right after number one. You count that mark there as the first mark, and then you just keep going until you hit the number two. If you do that, you'll find that there are 10 marks. So that means that you have a distance of one centimeter here, and there are 10 marks in between. So then each one of them must be one centimeter divided by 10, which is 0.1 centimeter. So that's the size of each of these little marks. That's important because that's going to help you to determine what is the length of your object. So if we look at this arrow, we first have to determine what is that number. So this is one, each one of this is 0.1. So if you keep going, you'll find that the longer one here in the middle is 0.5. And then the arrow is between 0.6 and 0.7. What you will say is that the length is 1.6. Now the last step you have to do is you need to add one digit as an estimate. This is important and a lot of times forgotten by students. You need to add one number there to include to tell people what is your estimate of exactly where that arrow lands on the ruler. For some of you, it might look like exactly in the middle between 1.6 and 1.7, in which case you would say 1.65. There you can say it, the length of that object is 1.65 centimeter. Some of you might look at that arrow and say, well, it's closer to the seventh side of the mark than to the sixth side of the mark. So you can say that it's 1.6 seven, 1.68 centimeter. Both of those are also fine choices. So you can see here in your lab procedure, the measurement is given as 1.67. The 1.6 doesn't change in all those three measurements that I gave you, 1.65, 1.67, and 1.68. They're all start with 1.6. So the 1.6 are what we call certain digits, right? They're the ones that are unchanging. And then the last digit, right, the five or the seven or the eight, that last digit is the one that keeps changing. So that last digit is what we call the uncertain digit, or sometimes it's also called the estimated digit. So your measurement, which is 1.67 centimeter or 1.68 centimeter, the combination of the certain and the uncertain digits is what your measurement value would be, okay? Now, what about if you're doing a volume of a liquid? That's slightly different. The way a liquid behaves in a glass measuring device, which is the typical one we use, is that it forms this 
shape, this is called a concave shape, the lowest point of that shape is called the meniscus of the liquid. And that's where we are going to read the volume of the liquid. So we're not going to read it here where it's higher in position. We're going to read it here at the lowest point. We follow the same steps. We would look at the numbers that we can see, which is 25, 30, and 35. If I read 25 to 30, I see that there are five marks in between. So if there's this is five, I'm assuming it's milliliters uh, is the unit. So there's five milliliters and there's five marks in between. So then what is the size of each mark? Well, I take five milliliters divided by five. That gives me one milliliter. So the size of each of these mark is one milliliter. Now, where is that meniscus located? It looks like it's exactly at 30. You might say, well, the volume is 30 milliliter. Don't forget, though, that the 30 is the certain digit. It's the three zero that's written there. You're going to need to add one more digit to give the estimate of where that meniscus actually lies. If you feel that that's exactly a 30, then your estimate is that it's 0, .0 because if there's no, it's not 30.5, it's not 29.7, it's exactly at 30, so it's 30.0. So the point zero there is the estimate. The 30 at the beginning is your certain digit. So again, the combination of the certain digits and the estimate or the uncertain digit is the total value of the measurement. The combinations of all the digits is what we call the significant figures of that measurement. So in this case, we have three significant figures uh, for that measurement, 1.67. There's one, two, three digits. This one, we also have three significant figures, three, zero, and the point zero. Those are all significant figures in the measurement. One of the more important things about significant figures is when you are doing calculations with them. So you might be using one measurement uh, and dividing it by another measurement, or you might be using one measurement and multiplying by another measurement. Okay, so how do you keep track of your significant figures? Because different measurements might not have the same number of significant figures. So here's an example. So it says here, student runs 18.752 meters in 54.2 seconds. Now, these two different numbers that are given to you are measured in different units. So the meters here could be measured using a meter stick, could be measured using some other instrument. The seconds is a measurement of time, so that could be measured using a stopwatch. So because there's two different devices, they have different number of significant figures. And as you remember, significant figures corresponds to precision. So in this case, this number has a higher precision, five significant figures, and this one only has three significant figures, which is a lower precision. The question is asking us to calculate the average velocity or speed of this student. Well, the way you can calculate velocity or speed is you have to take your distance and you have to divide it by the time, which is shown right here. So 18.752 meter divided by 54.2 seconds. If you just calculate that in your calculator, what you end up getting is this number right here, 0.345978 meters per second. Okay, so units divided by each other. That calculated answer is not the correct answer. It's not correct because you're not taking into account the precision of the measurement. Your instrument doesn't give you that many significant figures. So if I look at this calculated answer, I have six significant figures here. If you use that as your answer, you're basically telling whoever it is that reads this number that you're able to determine the speed of this student up till six significant figures. So you have an instrument that can measure to that level of precision. The truth is you don't. Your instrument is limited in the length side is limited to five significant figures in the time side it's limited to three significant figures so the question is which one should you use well the rule is we are conservative in the way we report these numbers we go with the lower number of significant figures so in this case the time gives us only three significant figures so we are going to report the number only up till three significant figures which means that the number has to end on the third number after the decimal point so you're going to report that by rounding your calculated answer to that position. Since the number next to five is nine, that number is gonna round up. So then our final answer is 0.346 meters per second. So that's how we do calculation 
when we're doing division or multiplication. If we end up doing an addition or subtraction, what we're gonna do is slightly different. So here's an example. You have a glass that's going to be filled with some water and you're adding those two numbers together to figure out what is the total mass. So in this case, you're adding 12.466 plus 10.33. Now in the calculator, you're gonna get 22.796. The key here is that when you're adding or subtracting, what you keep track of is not the total number of significant figures. What you keep track of is the digits after the decimal, because that's really what tells you what the limit of the precision is. Because remember when we're reading those meter stick earlier or the graduate cylinder, we add one more digit to the precision. So the number of digits after the decimal really tells you what is the precision of the measurement when you're doing this addition and subtraction. So in this case, we go again with the more conservative answer, which is the one with the lower precision, and would be the one that has fewer digits after a decimal. In this case, that second number only has two digits after a decimal. The first one has three. So we're gonna go with that as our final answer in terms of the precision. So we're gonna limit our final answer to just having two digits after a decimal point. That means rounding the nine, either up or down, depending on what the next number is. Well, the next number is six, so if it's six, then you round up, so it becomes 22.80 grams. All right, now let's go through the actual experiments that you're going to be doing. So the first experiment is you're going to be measuring the length and the width and diameter of different geometric shapes. The shapes could be a circle, could be a triangle, could be a rectangle, could be a square, whatever. Just a reminder how you measure these things. Remember, you need to read all the certain digits plus one uncertain digit. So don't forget that, right? That's a key technique that you need to be able to have in chemistry to be able to make correct measurements. So just to give you an example of this pencil right here, using a ruler, I would start reading it from zero all the way to where it ends right here. And the number looks like it's exactly on that five. One. Now, again, what I have to do is figure out what is the size of each of these mark right here. This is seven, this is eight. The ruler is really given in centimeters. I know it says millimeters here, but the millimeter corresponds to each of the marks. So one mark is one millimeter, second one, so on. So the one here is one centimeter or 10 millimeters. So when you go right here, this is seven and eight centimeters. Each mark therefore must be 0.1 centimeter because we take one centimeter divided by the 10 different marks that we have there. This looks like it's exactly at five. So the measurement should be 7.50 centimeters. If you feel like that's exactly on five, you feel like it's a little bit after that five, but you know, pretty far away from the next mark, which is at 0.6, then you can say it's 7.51 centimeter. If you wanna express this in millimeter, you can say it's 75.0 millimeter or 75.1 millimeter. Now the measurement that's given here is actually not correct because they just give you the certain digits here. So remember that you need to add one more digit as the uncertain digit. Okay, so here's an example of how to use these numbers in calculation. So let's say you measure a rectangle and the rectangle has a length of 11.45 centimeter and a width of 5.22 centimeter. And the question is to calculate the area of a rectangle. Well, from your math class, you remember that the area of a rectangle is the length times the width. So in this case, we're just gonna take those two measurements and multiply them together, giving us 59.769 square centimeters. So this 59.769 is the calculated answer, the answer you get from the calculator. The question is, how should you write the correct answer? Because this is a multiplication, will depend on the number with the fewest number of significant figures, the least precise number, which is the second number right here, the 5.22. That number only has three significant figures, so our final answer should also have three significant figures. That means we need to round it to that position. This is why they're highlighted in yellow. So to round that one, you're gonna look at the next number, which is six. Six is telling you that this number has to be rounded up, so our final answer is 59.8 square centimeter. In part B of this experiment, you're going to be measuring the volume of water in two types of devices, a graduated cylinder and a beaker. I'm going to show an example here on how to read for the graduated cylinder. So you can see here there is a number 60 and then there's a number 70 and then there's the number 80. 
Again, the first goal is to determine the size of these marks. There's 10 different units here, which is 10 milliliters. And so each of these marks, since there's 10 different marks, is 10 milliliters divided by 10 marks gives you one milliliter for every mark. For if this is 70, that must be 71, 72, 73, 74. And you read where the meniscus is. So the meniscus is that bottom level right there. So that's gonna be 74. Some of you might think that the meniscus is some, somewhere slightly higher here and that's fine. It's a little, you know, sometimes that, that is up to the decision of the person reading, but definitely it's not the one right here because that's going to be too high, right? It's definitely, you're not reading it from this side, you're reading it right here in the middle. So you might say that it's between the 74 and 75. If that's your measurement, then you would say it's 74.5. That 0.5 is your estimate. If you believe that the meniscus is exactly at this line right here, which corresponds to 74, you would say 74.0 milliliter. In part C, you're going to be measuring the mass of solids using two different types of instruments. One is called a digital balance. This is an example of one. It's not exactly the one that you will be using in the lab, but it's similar. And you can see that this is an easy instrument to use because all you need to do is put your object there and then that number will change. The second one is something called the triple beam balance, which looks like this. And in order to make the measurement here, you're gonna need to make some adjustments on these levers of the balance in order to get the correct mass. There is a video attached to the lab page. It's a very short two, three minute video, just walking you through how to read what a triple beam balance measurement looks like. The last part of the experiment is about determining what's called the melting point of an unknown solid. The melting point is the temperature at which a solid becomes a liquid. That is uh, going to exist for every solid that we have. For example, a very familiar solid that we know of, ice, turns into liquid water at zero degrees Celsius under normal pressure. So we would call that the melting point of ice at zero degrees Celsius. In this particular lab, you're going to be given a substance. The substance is gonna be a white powder and that white powder can be one of these guys right here. These are the identities and these are the melting points of those specific solids. Now, you're not going to be told which solid it is. Your goal is to identify the solid by looking at what the melting point is. The way the experiment is set up is as follows. You're going to put the solid into what we call a capillary tube. It basically looks like a, a, a very skinny tube when the solid is going to be right here at the bottom of the tube. You're gonna tie that next to a thermometer. And then what you're going to do is put that in what we call a water bath, which is just a beaker that's filled with water. And underneath that water bath, you're going to warm up the water bath with flame from the Bunsen burner. At some point, you're going to reach the melting point of that solid. And when you reach that, that solid will turn into liquid and you can see it just by looking at it really closely. And that's how you're going to determine the melting point. So this, for example, is your solid. Next to the solid is really just pieces of metal that sort of flanks that capillary tube. But in this case, you have the capillary tube right in the middle. The solid is the white solid, right? And you're heating this up. As you're heating it, you're gonna start seeing some change there as the solid melts. Okay, so here the solid is melting and eventually you can see here all the solid turns into liquid. All you're going to do is record the temperature that you see when the solid is completely turned into a liquid. 